Hi, and welcome. We're talking about stewardship of the earth, and Joe can do a much better sermon about this than I ever could. So I'll just talk briefly about what we can do as a church and as individuals. As a church, we've got a group of people that are looking into becoming an earth care congregation. It's something the Presbyterian church is doing around us and some of the local churches are looking into. Um, Joe already does great sermons about the environment. Wayne and Susan Letizia are real good about picking up our bulletins and things after services and recycling them. Um, there's lots of good stuff going on, but there's more that we could do. And if you're interested, please let me know, or Wayne and Susan, and we'll let you know ways that you can be involved. The other things we can do are more personal at home. Um, we can take our own bags to the grocery store. Uh, if you forget them, you can always recycle the ones, the little plastic bags that they give you. You can carpool to church. It gives you somebody fun to talk to on your way. You can, you can stop using plastic water bottles. Uh, Lee and I found this to be a benefit to us. We used to bring a plastic bottle of water with us every time we got in the car and we went out and bought ourselves Yetis. They keep our cold drinks cold, our hot drinks hot, and there's a whole lot of water bottles not going to landfills and stuff now. You can use things that take a little bit less plastic, um, such as laundry sheets or things, rather than get the big old tubs full of laundry. There's sheets that you can use now. There's all kinds of things you can do. Talk to me, talk to Wayne, talk to Susan. There's lots of things we can do. You can Google things to do. Um, Barb Enos takes used cotton t-shirts and things and actually makes dog beds out of them, takes them to the animal shelter. So that's a real good use of things. Sometimes we just buy a little bit less than we thought we needed, uh, recycle things that we have bought, lots of things. So let me know if you wanna help. If you need some ideas, I'd be happy to talk with you about it. So would Wayne and Susan. Think of it as a spiritual practice of taking care of this beautiful creation. Thanks, bye-bye. Friends, this is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Pastor Joe Albright, and I want to welcome all of you uh, to this time of worship online. And uh, I want to say a very special word of welcome to those of you who are here as visitors. We're delighted that you've joined us today. If you can believe it, Easter Sunday is already right around the corner. It's coming up on April the 4th. And... For those of you who might be wanting to worship in person, um, we are going to have two services here at Geneva that morning, a 9 o'clock and a 10.30. And if you can believe it, our 10.30 is already starting to fill up. Um, so if you know you're coming, if you could call the church office or email the church office and let us know, uh, we'd like to plan to accommodate everybody safely as we can. We, we still are trying to spread out as much as possible and consider coming to the, to the 9 o'clock service. And we will celebrate on that Sunday together. Today, as an aspect of our worship, we are celebrating communion. And if you've not done so already, I would invite you to take a moment, maybe put this on pause. You can set a table. If you'd like to have a candle there or a Bible, uh, grab a cup of juice or wine, some bread, tortilla, Later in the service, we will bless these elements and we will celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And now I'd invite you to focus your hearts and your minds on Christ as we go to him in worship. Deep inside us all, old and young alike, there is a place of faith, a place of trust and hope and love without which there can be no peace. Jesus said, Let the children come unto me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Here then, people of God, approach this hour as children of the Almighty, with innocence of heart 
and unlimited hope. Let us worship the Lord. is present right here right now as you do may you come to realize that God cares so much about the quality of our lives that God invites us to change and grow it's time to make a clean break from the mistakes and failures of the past by confessing all those things that get in the way of true life please pray with me God of new life, we cry out to you as people in a fractured world. We live in a world where the innocent sometimes suffer and die, where hopes and dreams can dissolve, and where evil seems to triumph. Sometimes we lose hope. Sometimes we become negative or cynical. Sometimes we fail to believe your promises and to act on them. Forgive us these times, O oh God. Remind us again that with you all things are possible and that even we can be made new. Empower us to live with the power and hope of the resurrection so that we might take hold of the life that is truly life. We humbly ask you to hear now our silent prayers of confession. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy upon us. Friends, hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
Today's scripture reading is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Some time back, I heard about a woman named Georgine Johnson who ended up running a marathon by accident. She lined up with the wrong group at the starting line. Initially, her plan was to run the 10K, not the marathon. But she start, ended up, she, it turns out she started with the wrong group. And it was not until the four mile mark that she realized her mistake. And at that point, she decided just to keep going. And she ended up finishing the race in four hours and four minutes. Later, she explained, I thought to myself, this is not the race I entered. This is not the race I trained for, but for better or worse, this is the race I'm in. Maybe there have been moments in your life when you when you felt like that. I'm not doing exactly what I planned on doing. I'm not exactly where I thought I would be at this stage in my life. Uh, there, there was this detour or, or that turn or this unexpected event. But here I am, for better or worse, this is the race I'm in. In the book of Hebrews, the race that is set before us is life itself. And the question is not whether we're going to run the race, but how we're going to run it. And if we're going to try to run this uh, somehow in tune with God, or in tune with God's purposes, then that's going to require great faith, perseverance, endurance. In fact, in the original language, the word used for race is agon, uh, it's a Greek word, and it's a root word for our word agony. It implies a struggle. And so if you think about it, this, this race, this, this great journey of life that we're on, last week we talked about it as a pilgrimage. You know, sometimes it's so full of joy and beauty and wonder, and other times heartbreak and tragedy. And so the author of this letter knew that there would be times in our lives and on this journey when we'd want to give up. That there'd be times when maybe it'd be easier not to follow Christ. When it'd be easier not to be a part of a community of faith. It'd be easier not to sacrifice for the good of others. It would just be plain simpler to go with the secular flow of things. The author also knew that there'd be times on this journey when we would face temptation. We'd get run down. We'd let our addictions get the best of us. We'd make mistakes. And there'd be other times when we would just simply grow weary and lose heart. You know, I think about this past year and the effect that that's had on so many of us. And so, so this chapter begins, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. I love this imagery of being surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. I mean, just the word witness is, is so rich. In, in meditation, there, there's this idea of witnessing your own thinking. Right? of getting just a, a fraction of distance between yourself and your thoughts where you, you can witness and observe not only your own breath, but your own mind at work, your thought process. 
And then there's also the legal context of the word. Something or someone that serves as evidence. I remember many years ago now a pastor telling me that, uh, that when he was a teenager and young adult, he, he struggled with racism, just how he grew up. And he said, you know, I, I did some things and I said some things that I'm certainly not proud of. But today, he works in a ministry of racial reconciliation and justice. And, and I think about him and I think, wow, that's evidence. That's evidence of God's grace. That's evidence of God's hand at work. A witness can also be someone who has, has seen something and they tell what they've seen, or they've experienced something, and they tell what they've experienced. The rabbi, Ariel Berger, who was a, a student of the late Elie Wiesel, he talks about this idea of witness. And he says that, that we humans, we have the capacity to encourage, to inspire, and to empower others when we tell what we've seen, when we tell our own stories, or when we tell other people's stories. I mean, what is a community of faith if not a great cloud of witnesses? So, so the book of Hebrews, it reminds us that we are surrounded by this crowd, that we are surrounded by these people who have been touched by God's grace. They've been through it, and they're there to support us and encourage us and inspire us. Now, in my very limited experience with running races, uh, the crowd can definitely pull you forward. The crowd can give you energy that you didn't even know you had. It's well documented that a runner can go faster and farther with a crowd behind them. And then, of course, you could think about the uh, in, in football, the tremendous home team advantage. I mean, just the energy of the crowd gives that edge. When I think about this crowd behind me and this great cloud of witnesses, you know, I, I think about the people that, uh, that brought me into the faith and that have nurtured my faith and the people that helped me keep the faith now. Of course, I think about my grandfather, Popsy, and her Mesa, who was my pastor, and, and my friend, Billy Rutledge, who came alongside me early on when I was in my 20s. But then I also think about how in this day and age, I think about the greater witness of the, uh, the, the Christian community at large that we have access to. There, there's this great podcast that I love now. It's called Pray As You Go. It's 12 minutes, and you get a new one every day. And it starts with a little sacred music, and then some scripture, a few questions for reflection, and silence for prayer. It's beautiful. Remember early on in my ministry, I, I remember hearing Eugene Peterson. Uh, he was a keynote speaker at a conference I attended, and he was talking to a bunch of young pastors, those of us who are new in the ministry. And he said to us, try to choose one or two authors that you will read and reread and that you'll come back to again and again and again, and let them be your spiritual guides. Let them guide you and shape you in your faith. Now, for me, that's been Wendell Berry and Peterson himself, and more recently, Nowen, Henry Nowen. And then on a whole nother level, you know, I, I can think about my, um, my family and friends who are in the recovery movement, and they tell me that they couldn't do it without the love and support of their recovery communities. I mean, the witnesses, the stories that they're able to share with each other give them meaning and hope and pull them forward. So Hebrews, this, this book, it's telling us, listen to the testimony of those who have gone before you, and maybe even those who are just a little ahead of you. Draw energy from them. They can help you. But then, don't stop there, because the author goes on to say, let us run the race looking to Jesus. Other translations say, fix your eyes on Jesus. And I love that. I mean, just on one level, Jesus, 
He's run this race before you. I mean, he, he knows the temptations. He knows the struggles. And he knows you. And on a deeper level, he's more than just an example. Because he can do what no one else can. I remember my last year of seminary, uh, one of the last classes that I had, it was, it was kind of a, a nuts and bolts classes uh, um, of the ministry. And we talked about budgets and running a session meeting and stewardship campaigns, just the, the kind of things a pastor needs to know before leaving school and going out into a church. And at the very end of the class, the, the uh, professor brought in a retired Presbyterian minister to talk with us. And this guy, this guy, he had been through it. I mean, years of ministry. He was in his 70s at that time and so much wisdom. And he shared with us about the need to, to persevere, the need to be out there visiting our people, um, the, the need to make those hospital visits. And, and he told us all about the ins and outs, the good and the bad and the difficult of, of ministry. But at the very end, he said, now here's the most important thing. If you don't remember anything else, don't ever forget the power of Jesus Christ to change lives, even yours. And I've never forgotten it. In fact, in the 20 years since, I've seen it happen again and again and again to the point that now, it doesn't matter what the situation is. It doesn't matter what the person might have done. It doesn't matter what might have happened. I always hold out for redemption. I hold on to hope. I hold on to the possibility of change because I believe in the power of the risen Lord to renew, to restore, and to make whole again. My prayer for you today is that, that you would give some thought as to the witnesses who surround you. What voices are you carrying with you on this great journey of life? What voices give you energy and inspiration and strength and help you in your faith? And then, and then maybe you could even ask yourself, what have I seen? How has God's grace touched my life? What stories do I have to tell? And finally, and most importantly, above everything else, may you look to Christ, because he can indeed do what no one else can. He will be there and await you at the end of your journey. And he is there with you every step of the way. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. Um, I'm Rick Elbrucht, and uh, I'd like to share with you today uh, how I let go of my past and set a new course uh, for a brighter future as a disciple of Jesus Christ. A little background I think is necessary. I was born into a military family and baptized Presbyterian. My life as a military child consisted of moves every two to three years, new schools, and many new faces. So I had no lasting relationships except one, and that was with my brother, Mike. He was my best friend. Our family did attend church when possible, but for me, it was not where I wanted to be, and eventually I stopped going. After graduating high school and experienced difficulties with my father at home, I left, drifted around the country, and I was finally drafted into the Army. On my first leave, I did go home, and the next morning, we were all awakened at five to a knock on the door, and it was the news that my brother had been killed while serving in Vietnam. Uh, this event would change our family forever. I just lost my best friend and didn't know how to deal with it, and my parents were in their own pain and could not offer any help. Uh, now, I know we all have difficulties throughout life. In fact, the Bible tells us to expect it, but it also instructs on how to handle these setbacks, but I was not aware of them. Not taking time to grieve and not knowing how to process his death, I went looking for a place to hide and to heal, just not in the right direction. I tried many avenues to find a way to not feel the pain 
and loss. I took up studying and practicing Eastern religions, but when that left me unfulfilled, I turned to other unhealthy life choices. I thought I was in control, but all these endeavors left me empty, and my life began a slow downward spiral. But God had a plan. During my worst days, I was fortunate to have friends trying to help, and then one evening, I believed God intervened and began to work a miracle. Usually, I would leave my phone unplugged in the evening, but for some reason, this night, I had left it plugged in, and that was the night a friend, I now call her my angel, had asked a trusted counselor to call me. For me, it was like God calling to say he knew I was hurting and he could offer a way out. I had to decide to set a new course and let God lead the way. As we learned last week, letting go can be scary. Even when you're leaving behind your destructive habits, it's still scary. On that date, over 35 years ago, I began a journey of faith and the only one who can understand our pain and offer a hope for a better tomorrow, and for me, that's Jesus Christ. With the help of friends, trusted brothers and sisters in Christ, and the grace of God, I was able to grieve my brother's death and restore my broken relationship with my father and start a new life. I did have a real course reset by giving up my life where I thought I was in control and putting my trust in God. There have been challenging and difficult times since then, but as I have grown in my faith, I rely more and more on the healing power of Christ to direct my path. Now, last Sunday, Pastor Joe said that all roads belong to God, and he can use any road to bring us home. And for me, God has. Since this transformation, I've been blessed in many, many ways. What's important is that I did not do this alone. Many friends led me to a new life, and they continue to encourage me, share my ups and downs, and correct me when necessary. Today, my strength comes from God's Word and my church family, and I'm grateful to be called a child of God and have you all as my friends in Christ. Thank you. Oh.
If you'd like to make an offering, there are one of two ways you can do that. You can always just go on our website, and on the front page there is a link to give. If you follow that link, it's very simple. And of course, you can always just mail a check in to the church office. Our weekly offerings are the means by which our worship and all of our ministry and mission happen. And we give in response to God's love and mercy and grace. One of the images of heaven is the communion table, the banquet table. And we talk about it as the joyful feast of the people of God. And Jesus said that people will come from east and west. They'll come from north and south. The scriptures tell us that there'll be people there of every nation, every language, every race. I mean, it will include that great cloud of witnesses that we spoke about today. This is not a Presbyterian table. This table does not belong to Geneva. This is the Lord's table. And our Savior invites all of you who trust in him to share in this simple feast that he has prepared. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, you have blessed us so richly, and we thank you 
for friends, family, for hands to hold, for more than enough food to eat. We thank you for this family of faith, this great cloud of witnesses, and for our part in it, for the way in which you have been so faithful to us. We especially thank you today for the way that you promise to love us without limit, without condition. We pray now for this world that you so love, lifting up to you in these next moments of silence the prayers on our hearts for our nation. for our families and loved ones. And for the world at large. And now, loving God, pour out your spirit upon us and upon this bread and cup that the bread we break and the cup we bless would be a communion with Christ. Nourish us and renew us Strengthen us to live our lives together as your giving and forgiving family. Hear us now as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On that night that Jesus was betrayed, he sat at that table with his closest followers, his disciples. And he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, take this and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this, and remember me. At this time, I would invite you to take a piece of your bread and break it, remembering that Jesus said, this is the bread of life. Take and eat. And in the same way, at the table, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant that is sealed in my blood, which will be shed for the forgiveness of your sins. As often as you drink it, remember me. Friends, at this time, I invite you to take your cup, remembering that this is the cup of salvation given for you. Take and drink. Please pray with me. We thank you, loving God, for feeding us with the bread of life and nourishing us with the cup of salvation. May we who have been nourished and fed in your name return to this world to feed and nourish others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Now, my friends, I pray that the light of Christ would surround you, the love of Christ enfold you, the power of Christ protect you, the presence of Christ watch over you. Wherever you are, Christ is. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.